coming up next to the stage, this next performer just got through writing her life story three times because she's had several lives at once. She recently performed a, a one-woman play together with Gloria Steinem. It's amazing. It's brilliant. It's so very brilliant. She, she has been reported to have taught Mother Teresa every damn thing she knows. You know, she was like, you know, really, um, no, you're not going to go with Jill. You're not going to call yourself Jill. Nobody will respect Jill. Nobody will look to Jill for the world's answers. Mother Teresa, and it just stuck. That's how it goes. <laughs> Mother Jill, 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 Jill doesn't roll off the, you know, it doesn't sound authentic. It doesn't roll right off. It, 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 it doesn't sound authentic. You know what I'm saying? I am troubled in my soul. I need help. I'll go talk to Jill. <laughs> You know it's funny when you make her do that. Give it up for Janet K coming to the stage. I have to teach Mother Teresa a thing or two. And then it cuts off. Hi! Um, hello, I'm Janet. And yeah, if you needed to know anything, because, you know, Mother Teresa didn't get all of my advice, so uh, I don't know. Um, and I get it, exposure, expansion, growth, change. But, but I heard that my old house is now a storage warehouse. Back where I used to live, and I, and I get it, times change, but I keep wondering if I forgot anything there. And after all this time, I wonder if I could ever get any of it back. Well, you see, you rest assured that it's in storage. <laughs> but I don't have the key. So what's up with that? How do I, what? <laughs> um, I have two pieces about 9-11, and I feel terrible because I'm only a Chicagoan that witnessed it in New York, though I have friends that were in <clears throat> D.C. and in New York and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, so I just got to see it from afar and didn't know what to do, and I was going to read to you about that. Um, this is September 11th, 2001. I remember my husband getting ready for work, and I walked to the TV in the den, and I thought he was watching a movie. He said, I, I don't think this is a movie. And I think the World Trade Center has been struck. And we stared at the television and watched a plane fly into the second tower. And then we watched the towers collapse. I, I can't even remember if my husband went to work that day. I just stared at that TV. It took two days to get through to everyone. My friend and one brother-in-law rescheduled Pentagon meetings. We tried to call his sister in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Our nephew heard news reports that if Flight 93 landed 30 seconds later, the plane would have hit his school. My brother-in-law in New Jersey was supposed to be at the World Trade Centers for a meeting that day, but you see, he decided to not go to the meeting. Lucky him. And I remember watching the TV and I was like some sort of zombie, thinking that this was bigger than Pearl Harbor. More people died. This wasn't a military base. I, I, I had to do something. Maybe I could go there. I've traveled around the country by car before. I could drive this. Maybe I could stay at my husband's brother's place in New Jersey in Trina and Manhattan. My husband couldn't go, so I took off on my own, paid the tolls on I-80, even forgot my camera, got to, my, got to his brother's place at one in the morning. He told me to train to trade, but said half of the subway lines had been closed. So I trained from Jersey as far as I could. I couldn't get close, but I thought, I've walked seven miles to work. This is no problem, an hour and a half. I can do that. 
I, I thought I could buy an instant camera or some small shop on my walk to ground zero. And maybe I could take a film canister so I could collect some of the building dust. Because someone gave me ashes from Mount St. Helens eruption and I have a part of the Berlin Wall and I thought, I've lived through this. I should bring something back with me. I should, I should something. But, but every store was closed, and I tried to walk anywhere and everywhere that day. Everything was congested. Businesses seemed closed, but you still couldn't go anywhere. So over four hours later, I got to ground zero. I was wearing gym shoes and jeans and a bottle of sealed water in my backpack purse. I, I wanted to get in to try to help. I don't, I don't know with what, to, to, to shovel some things out of the way to something. But no one had maps of where anything was, and there were so many people there trying to help that they told me the best thing that I could do to help was just to stay clear and clear the way so that people could do their jobs. And I just stepped back, unable to do anything, unable to collect anything, unable to photograph anything, only just able to stare like I was watching it on TV. <laughs> In this, I used only lowercase in writing this, even when I said, I, I'm only lowercase. When I watched the news on that first day, they showed people jumping out the windows. And as they fell, you heard a sharp crash of concrete. And everyone at Ground Zero no heard a symphony of distress signals from the firefighter transmitters with percussion from that regular rip of cracking concrete. The, these silhouettes of people look like floating paper in a ticker tape parade and all this debris was floating around. I had to keep telling myself these are our people. And when I look around at all of the remains from these towering office buildings, I thought of the dust that I was breathing in. And I thought, I'm breathing in drywall. I'm breathing in paperwork. I'm breathing in people. So yes, I'm only lowercase. After what I've seen around me, I'm nothing. Yeah. Um, I don't even have a copy of my book with me, but um, a few years ago I decided for some insane reason that I would write a poem for every element in the periodic table. <laughs> All 118 of them, and I did some bonus poems, and this was a bonus poem from, it was Sulphur uh, bonus poem, which is number 16 in the periodic table, in case anyone cares. Um, and this is a piece called Sm Smell, so, now I'm gonna try to say it, Smelling Sulphur on 911. <sighs> I'm a journalist. I, I can remember the sounds of the newsroom as I finished my article at one of the computers, and I can still hear the sounds of the bustling and the rushing sounds toward a deadline. <laughs> the shuffling of paper was a common presence when you worked. Hearing that low hum, that din of action and activity is almost comforting to types like us. It's like the bass beat to the symphony of our lives. So when you hear the words 911, you think of the number to dial when you hear of more gun violence on these Chicago streets. The smell of sulfur and the gunpowder and other scents that accentuates the center of the world around us. But on a beautifully sunny day like today, you come into a newsroom in the early morning and the sound of action has yet to truly penetrate the ears of these reporters with a star from coffee cup in one hand, crumpled papers of edited copy in the other. But on this sunny morning, the din was different, much more 
cacophonous, but much more rushed, while still so hushed. I made my way to one of the TV sets along the main wall, then we were all on different channels showing different bits of news, though they all suddenly seemed the same. I, it looked like the newsroom was watching a movie as smoke poured from one of the Twin Towers. I, I tried to make out the voices of one of the TV sets when I witnessed a plane right before my eyes fly into the other tower. I stood for a moment, transfixed like some horror movie addict before I thought of my contacts scattered along the East Coast. I pulled out my cell phone and I speed dialed Mark in New York. He, he had a meeting scheduled at Twin Towers this morning and the phones were jammed so I dialed Don who was in the town there for that week but all was lost to computer simulated voices forcing me to leave messages and scramble from afar. As pathetic as we were we stared at TVs as more forms of communications were cut off from us. This was an attack on New York. We struggled to discover unless until less than 20 minutes later we saw a two second long film replay, played repeatedly from a DC security camera that caught a collision course crashing of a plane through the outer rings of the Pentagon. Well, now the story has changed. <laughs> Trying to get through to Dan in D.C. He was supposed to be in Pen the Pentagon today, but the phones were still cut off. So we scrambled for any data, looking for a Chicago connection. The Sears Tower, the John Hancock Building, these were national icons that may be under attack. They're escaping. They're making people evacuate the Sears Tower right now. But before we could gain our bearings, only 25 minutes passed before a plane crashed into the ground near Shanksville. Pennsylvania. Shanksville, I thought. I, I know someone there. I searched and found Anna's number, but <laughs> was I kidding? Those lines were cut off, too. It's a strange feeling, being a reporter and not being able to contact a single person. Being detached from any lead, coupled with a sinking feeling, wondering if any of the people you know are physically hurt or even alive. As a journalist, you feel really helpless, like your hands are tied behind your back. We give the news. We're not supposed to feel so stranded. An hour after the Pentagon was attacked, the Sears Tower was evacuated, and this wasn't my beat. I had no contacts. No one helped me through this disaster. So I waited there in case anyone needed any assistance. I sat back for a moment, left there to wait, thinking about Mark and Don in New York, Dan in D.C., and, and poor Anna. I'm sure she's not hurt, but they're now cut off to me. As I said... All I could do was wait. Clear your head of the people, I could hear myself say to myself. You're a reporter. Just break down the details of what you see instead of thinking of this on another one. Just think of it as like another one of your human interest stories, maybe. The jet fuel, the, the drywall, that's all paper in those offices, those people trapped, they're all hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, but, but wait a minute. In Chicago, I think of the sulfur smell when it comes to gunfire, but jet fuel is sulfur laden and that burning drywall emits sulfur gas. Sulfur is even the third most common mineral in the human body. I mean, I'm a newspaper reporter. I know that sulfur-based compounds are used in pulp for paper industries. Yeah, I'm a newspaper reporter. Just take a breath and turn your head to the stats. To clear my head of the humanity, the thought of so much sulfur being so much a part of so many details in our lives made me think of the destruction the sulfur was so much a part of today. I know I stayed here to give a helping hand, but with all that sulfur on my mind, suddenly 
I couldn't smell. All I could smell was the burning. And I couldn't, <coughs> and I couldn't stop coughing while I tried to catch my breath again. Jamie Capital, ladies and gentlemen.